This talk will first be delivered Friday, March 5th, 2010 to Ian Jockin's research group. I will discuss the physics, experimental observations, and modeling methods used to determine how water propagates through the subglacial drainage system. First, I'd like to discuss three physical mechanisms through which water is stored and released into the subglacial drainage system. The first of these are subglacial tunnels. Tunnels are formed as a balance of melting due to turbulent water flow and creep closure due to ice deformation. In these subglacial conduits, the discharge of water and the pressure in that water are inversely related. That is, if we have a large tunnel with a large amount of water going through it, it will have a lower pressure than a smaller tunnel with a smaller amount of water going through it. These subglacial tunnels have been observed at the terminus and lower reaches of glaciers and ice sheets, and in addition to that, <coughs> dye experiments often show that water near the terminus is primarily routed through subglacial tunnels. The second mechanism I'd like to discuss are distributed or interconnected cavities. These form on the down glacier side of bedrock highs. Flow of water in these systems is usually not described by its path, but rather by the discharge flux in the hydraulic head. However, these systems can be observed in nature or experimentally as well. That is, in dye experiments, if a discharge of dye input up glacier emerges from the terminus as a dispersed and diffuse tie emerging from several tunnels, that typically indicates that at least up glacier at some point a distributed system exists. In addition, subglacial cavitation, which is a symptom of a distributed system, is implicitly ob observed when water filling these subglacial cavities tends to raise the surface of the ice up. Last, I briefly mention the flow of water through soft bedded glaciers. In soft bedded glaciers, the glacier rests on a sheet or distributed set of subglacial sediments which are permeable, deformable, and compressible. The water flux through these sediments is described by something called Darcy's Law, which is a lot like Fourier's Law. It states that the water flux through these sediments is proportional to the pressure gradient. Therefore, if you increase the pressure gradient, you can push more water into this till. Today I'm going to focus on distributed and interconnected cavities. In a follow-up talk, I'll also talk about tunnels and then briefly describe saturated till. So we all agree on what we mean when we say a distributed system. Let's consider an ice column that sits in the middle of a glacier or ice sheet. Water is stored on the surface of this ice column in either snow, fern, or superglacial lakes. Crevasses or moulons exist in the interior of this glacier which can deliver water from the surface to the bed. And at the bed, we have a series of topographical highs in the form of bumps on the bedrock. On the lee or down glacier side of these bumps are cavities. Water is then pushed through these cavities down glacier by a pressure gradient. Now that we all have the same qualitative picture on our heads, I want to turn this cartoon into a quantitative model. To do so, I'm going to use conservation of mass for water flow near the bed of this ice column. In the figure you're looking at right now, you see a series of expressions and arrows in a volume element sitting near the bed of this ice column. Each one of these expressions describes the volume of water flowing through or out or into this volume element. Mass conservation can be stated in words as follows. The mass going into a volume element minus the mass going out of a volume element plus the change in mass stored in the element plus the change in mass added by a source is equal to the total change in mass in the element. Now, mass conservation and volume conservation are identical in the case where you have an incompressible fluid, like water in this case. So for the remainder of this derivation, I'm going to refer to volume and not mass. Starting in the lower left hand corner, the expression you see there is the area of the volume element multiplied by the velocity of the water at that position multiplied by the time over which the velocity is measured. That represents the volume going in. To the right of that, you see the area evaluated down glacier multiplied by the velocity evaluated down glacier multiplied by the time over which that velocity is measured. That represents the volume going out of the element. Both of those measurements are taken at the same time. 
During the time we measured the velocity going into and out of the subglacial volume element, the cross-sectional area of that element may have been changing. Between the downglacier and upglacier grid points, we measure the time rate of change of the cross-sectional area. We multiply that times the time over which that area was measured multiplied by the downglacier distance. This gives us a change in volume stored in that element. In addition to the volume stored, the volume going in and the volume going out, there may be a source term. This represents either a volume sink or a volume source supplied by, say, a conduit or a crevasse. In summary, these expressions provide a volume or mass balance, if we multiply through by density, in the subglacial drainage system.